Well, I'm very pleased to be able to come here today and to present some of our, our findings to you. Um, in our centre, we, we focus on the interrelationship between social and biological factors going on in affecting each other over people's uh, lifespan. And this particular uh, study, looking at uh, the influence of breastfeeding, exemplifies some of the challenges we face when, when doing this sort of research. So the um, subtitle of my talk was, Can Breastfeeding Really Increase One's Life Chances? And here we're talking about um, one's chances in being socially mobile. So does breastfeeding increase your chance of being in a higher social class than, than your parents um, or prevent you from being in a lower social class than your parents? And why might this be um, of interest? Well, first of all, I just thought I'd say for the, the men in the audience, I'm sorry, but there's no evidence, and there's no research evidence that breastfeeding beyond infancy has any particular <laughs> benefits to you, to your health or your social standing. And I'd like to also reassure the women in the audience, especially the academics here, that you're not likely to become a mid-class member of the Women's Institute either if you've been breastfed. And neither are your children uh, likely to become like Vicky Pollard if you uh, were unable or didn't want to breastfeed you're unlikely to be out of uh, employment, education, or training, uh, like this character from Little Britain. Um, but on a more serious note, why, why is breastfeeding uh, something worthy of research? Uh, this slide shows the initiation rates across Europe uh, in breastfeeding, and you can clearly see that we are at the bottom of the pile when it comes to uh, breastfeeding. Uh, compared with countries like uh, Norway, where there's almost universal breastfeeding uptake and breastfeeding is maintained throughout infancy until at least six months of the child's life, here in Britain we have only a 69% uptake in starting to breastfeed and the majority of those will have given up breastfeeding within the first week or two. So these are sort of quite stark differences and are they going to have an effect on uh, public health and on the economy of the country if, if we don't manage to change people's habits in, in this country? And that's the sort of subtext of, of this talk today. Well, the first thing I normally get asked when talk, uh, I present work on, on breastfeeding is, well, why should there be a link between breastfeeding and social mobility? What on earth can the mechanisms be? And there are several that have been hypothesized uh, in the uh, literature. Um, the most commonly cited uh, mechanism is the fact that breast milk contains long-chain polyunsaturated fatty acids. These are sort of components that are essential for cell growth and brain development. And it's thought that uh, these, these components of, of, of breast milk could be implicated in uh, increasing uh, children's brain development, hence they do better um, at school potentially, and then maybe more likely to be socially mobile. Unfortunately, the research evidence also shows that when these uh, fatty acids are added to formula milk, there doesn't seem to be a particular uh, difference in the children's development. But with the, the, the we're still unsure about, about that. There's also other constituents of breast milk which might make uh, children's development more beneficial and then have ongoing effects into their later life. Uh, for example, um, immune factors in, in breast milk uh, protect children against uh, infections and uh, work has shown that children who are breastfed are less likely to be hospitalised for uh, infections such as diarrheal infections or respiratory infections and, and, other, and you could link that with other research showing that uh, hospitalisation of, of infants and children does set back their development. So if they're, they're not becoming ill so often, uh, they may also, they again have more optimal development. Um, there are several growth factors that are, are part of breast milk 
And these, again, can support cell development in the brain and just general physiological development throughout childhood. And finally, there's a sort of a mechanism which has been suggested in that the skin-to-skin -skin contact that you get when breastfeeding between the mother and the infant improves the infant's response to stress and it sort of sets their response mechanism. So not only does it sort of um, placate them during childhood, but it can mean that um, when they grow up into adulthood, um, they're just better able to deal with, with the stresses of life and then may also mean that they're more likely to be able to fulfill their potential and uh, become upwardly mobile. So, so several different mechanisms that give a plausible link between breastfeeding and social mobility. And just to show you the results from some of those uh, routes, I'll start off with infancy at nine months of age. And this slide shows um, some delay in the developmental milestones that you'd normally expect nine-month-year-old children to be able to achieve. So gross motor milestones are things like being able to sit, uh, to, to crawl or shuffle along the floor, um, to stand up holding on to something. Um, those are the sorts of things you expect most nine-month-olds to be able to do. Um, the fine motor development is things like being able to pick up a pea to eat it or to clap hands, um, those sorts of uh, controls. And compared with the breastfed children, the non-breastfed children were more likely to be uh, delayed in achieving these milestones, both with the gross motor functions and the fine motor functions. Then if we go on to look at sort of the start of the school year, so uh, in this slide we're looking at the foundation stage profile which teachers complete on children as they enter school. And this profile assesses children um, on seven different domains of development, aspects such as language and communication skills, numeracy, literacy, um, understanding of the world, and, and, and social uh, and emotional um, adjustment. And there's a sort of a standard scoring mechanism that the government has set out for deciding whether children have reached a good level of overall achievement in all these domains. And this slide shows a, a, uh, a clear gradient from those who were never breastfed, about 37% achieved a good level of achievement, um, rising up almost 60% of children who are breastfed for four months or more reaching a good level of achievement. So here again, it does seem to be that um, cognitive ability could be affected uh, by this breastfeeding. And then going on, one stage later in life, so looking at the uh, senior school years, um, in this slide we're looking at the English SATs uh, results, um, which is part of the foundation stage profile. Uh, sorry, not the foundation, the key stage two uh, assessments that are part of the national curriculum. And here we have breastfeeding in days across the x-axis and the English results scores along the y-axis. And again, the longer that children are breastfed for, uh, the better their English SATS results. And over to the right, you can see an indication of what I was talking about when I said that there wasn't much evidence that breastfeeding for very extended periods of time carries on being beneficial uh, for children. So if I'm to go back to our, my research question, which is, is there a causal relationship between breastfeeding and social mobility? We come to the first of uh, the sort of issues that have to be faced when doing this sort of research. Because how can we um, determine causality? Uh, the gold standard in this area is to carry out a randomised control trial, but it would be um, unethical to carry out a randomised trial where you um, assign children to either be breastfed or not, and neither could we await the 30 or 40 years until we see what their social destinations are. So on practical and ethical grounds, it's not an option open to us to do a randomised control trial. So how else can we study the relationship between uh, breastfeeding and people's social destinations many years later. Well, fortunately, in the UK, 
we have a, a multitude of, of birth cohort studies. These are survey start studies which start in, at birth or sometime around uh, the child's birth and follow children up through their lives. So initially going back to their parents and their teachers and asking about all sorts of aspects of their development. And then once the cohort members are old enough themselves to participate, they also complete questionnaires and do assessments and that sort of thing. And we have the longest uh, study starting in 1946 and carrying on till today. And then at regular intervals, new studies have come on board. So in 1958 and then in 1970, uh, two more studies were funded by the uh, ESRC. These have followed roughly 17,000 children each, um, following children who were born in one week uh, in those respective years. And uh, the most recent study, the Millennium Cohort Study, is the one from which some of the slides I showed you before the data came from that study. There's a new study uh, planned for the end of next year, the LIFE study, uh, which is going to be the largest and most comprehensive uh, study, uh, adding in a much more uh, rigorous biological and uh, medical uh, component to it, as, as well as the uh, social and uh, economic side of, of children's lives. So, as I said, here we have data collected at birth and then we have data on them as they've gone into adulthood, and we're going to use that uh, to examine the relationship between breastfeeding and social mobility. But here we come to the problem. We're interested in the causal effect between breastfeeding and social mobility. We want to know that direct relationship. And there's always an issue when you're using observational data, as survey data is called, isn't that we can't be sure about this relationship when we have a lot of other aspects of people's lives that might be influencing both their, chance, their, their decisions to breastfeed and also how the child is going to develop into adulthood. So, for example, mother's education influences whether she decides to breastfeed and mother's education is, is clearly related to uh, the children's social destinations as well. And when we have another variable like this that uh, is related both to our exposure, breastfeeding, and our outcome, social mobility, and we can't be sure about the relationship between breastfeeding and social mobility, we call this uh, an issue of confounding. And it's not just mother's education. There can be a plethora of other factors, housing, conditions, social class, and so on, and, and many, many more that can cause an artifactual relationship between breastfeeding and social mobility, so it is not necessarily uh, causal. So how do we get over that, that, that problem? Well, in this study, we used two different ways of trying to overcome the problem. First of all, we, looked, we used the fact that we have these multiple birth cohort studies to uh, see if we could get exactly the same effect in two different studies. So we're looking to replicate our findings using two different studies. And secondly, we use a statistical method um, to try and mimic that randomized control trial I was talking about. And I'll go into details about that in a minute. So first of all, I want to go back to that, that issue of, of being able to look at two different studies and how that can be helpful. Well, these are the breastfeeding rates by social class at birth in the uh, two British cohort studies I'm using for the rest of this talk, the 1958 birth cohort and the 1970 birth cohort. And on the left-hand side, we have the most advantaged social groups, those in managerial and professional occupations. And on the right-hand side, in the sort of mustard color, the, um, the non-skilled manual occupations. And you can see two things in this slide. First of all, that in 1958, breastfeeding rates were much higher than in 1970. In fact, 1970 was a real low as far as breastfeeding rates are concerned. And rates now, as I showed on the earlier slide, are back, back to where they were for the 1958 uh, cohort. Um, and the other thing to notice is that the differences across social groups 
aren't so great for the earlier born cohort, the 1958 cohort, as the 1970 cohort. So here we have only small differences between groups for one cohort and quite large differences between social groups for the other cohort. So despite these differences, we're looking to see whether the effect of breastfeeding on children's outcomes is the same or not. If it's the same despite this different patterning, we might be more confident in being able to infer uh, causality. And then if we look at intergenerational social mobility in the two cohorts, this is a rather busy slide, don't um, worry too much about it. So um, we're looking at um, father's social class when the children are 10 or 11 years, that meant they were around the same, and then own social class when they were children had grown up and were now in their 30s. So when children were 10 or 11 for these cohorts, fathers were around the same age in their 30s as well on average. And there's three things to notice again about the differences between the 1958 and the 1970 cohort. First of all, for both cohorts, there's quite a lot of downward social mobility. People don't normally think about social mobility as people moving down and being in a low, lower social position than their fathers. They normally think about the fact that you know manufacturing has sort of come to a sort of here in this country and that most people are upwardly socially mobile into um, white collar occupations. But here you can see that there is actually quite a lot of downward social mobility as well. And again, we're going to exploit this difference but, uh, and look at both upward and downward social mobility because if we can see that breastfeeding has similar sort of influences on both upward and downward social mobility, again, it's sort of consistent with a causal um, interpretation. And in these two cohorts, we have different patterns again about of social mobility. So the total amount of what's called churning, people changing, is about the same in both cohorts. But the patterns are different. So for the 1958 cohort, uh, people are less likely, uh, are more likely to be downwardly mobile than in the 1970 cohort. But at the same time, they're less likely to be upwardly socially mobile than the 1970 cohort. So different patterns of social mobility, which again helps us with making a causal interpretation if we can see the same findings despite these different patterns. So I mentioned that the other way we were trying to um, be rigorous in our analysis was to use a statistical method which tries to mimic the randomized control trial. And this is called propensity score matching. So in principle, what happens? Well, in a randomized control, you have a child who's born and it's allocated to be in either a breastfed or a non-breastfed group. And then we can measure an outcome for the breastfed babies and the outcome for the non-breastfed babies. And because they're randomly assigned to these two groups, we can then say that the difference between the two is the breastfeeding effect, the true causal effect. Now, we can't do that. We have a birth cohort instead. And the birth cohort, the children are uh, in either not breastfed or breastfed according to their mother's choice or, you know, so other factors. And we can see the results for the non-breastfed child. We can see the outcome for the non-breastfed babies and we can measure that. But what we really want to be able to ask the question about is, if there was a policy intervention and we could move some of those non-breastfed babies over to the breastfed group, so the policy in intervention had some effect on changing um, the likelihood that children would be breastfed, then what would be the outcome then for those babies, those babies that have been able to be moved by the intervention? And this is called the counterfactual. Uh, it's the outcome for the non-breastfed babies if they had been breastfed. And then we can say that the, the causal effect for breastfeeding is the difference between the observed outcome for the non-breastfed babies and this counterfactual. But of course, we can't observe the counterfactual. It's just a hypothetical case of what would happen if we could shift some of those non-breastfed babies to the breastfed group. So we have to extrapolate from what we can observe to make those causal inferences. And that's what propensity score matching is all about. 
So here we have some, some uh, children in the non-breastfed group and another group in the breastfed group. And for each child in the non-breastfed group, we match them with a child in the breastfed group so that their, their conditions in which they're growing up and in which they were born match each other perfectly. And then we take another child and could do the same process, matching with another child who is like them. And so on, we keep going and repeating all the way through uh, with the whole group from the non-breastfed group. And if there's any children in the group that weren't breastfed, who we can't find a match for in the breastfed group, so for some reason, you know, their circumstances of their birth or whatever are so extreme that we cannot find a child to match them with, then those children don't participate uh, in the analysis. We discard their information and just concentrate on the children that we can match up together. So then what do we have? We have the outcome as before for the non-breastfed babies, which we are able to measure. And now we have the outcome for breastfed babies who look just like those non-breastfed babies. And by doing this matching, and if we still see an effect, again, we can be more confident about the uh, effect size that we've measured. So how do we match the children together? We used all the information. This is where the sort of cohort studies come into their own because they have so much information on, on children, on their births and their social circumstances. So we're able to match the children on sort of sociodemographic information about their parents, so their parents' ages, their education, their social position, um, their housing circumstances, whether there's any overcrowding and so on. We're able to look at the mother's fertility history because that might affect her propensity to breastfeed, so how many other children she has got, whether she's had any problems with previous births. Um, uh, um, and, 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 and all sort of other factors like that. We look at the pregnancy and how well that's gone for the mother, whether she was ill at all, uh, whether she smoked or drank, you know, so smoked during pregnancy, whether she was working during the pregnancy, um, those sorts of things. And then we look at the birth outcomes for the child itself, whether it was um, born at term or not, or if it was low birth weight, whether there were any birth problems with the birth itself, whether it was a natural birth or was by caesarean or whatever, um, whether the child had to uh, be in a special care uh, unit at all. So we match all these variables um, between the two groups of, of breastfed and non-breastfed children until we find matches for the, all, all the children. And in this next slide, you can see the, the effects of this matching. So um, the black squares show differences between the breastfed and the non-breastfed group uh, before the matching process. The further to the right, the greater the differences between the groups. Um, you can see that there are a lot of uh, differences on all the variables that we've used. And then the red triangles show the differences after the matching process. And they're all virtually at zero. There's no, statistically, there's no difference at all between the two groups after the matching process. So this shows that it's been successful, that we have managed to match the children successfully. Uh, um, and then we carry on and we look at those two match groups and see the outcome. So now we come to the punchline of, is there a relationship between breastfeeding and social mobility? So this slide shows... Uh, the effects expressed in odds ratios, that shows the ratio of the odds if you were breastfed compared with the odds if you weren't breastfed. And if this ratio is greater than one, that means that uh, the children who are breastfed are more likely to have the outcome. If the uh, ratio is less than one, it means they're less likely to have the outcome. And then we have uh, something called the 95% confidence interval. And that gives a range of values that we think, with 95% confidence, the true estimate would lie in. So we've, we've got an estimate from our sample of 17,000 babies in each cohort. That, that's a good-sized sample, but it doesn't represent all babies. So 
the confidence interval gives you a, a, a range around which you, within which you expect uh, the true value to lie. And if one isn't encompassed by this range, we can say that this isn't just some random finding, that there, there are differences between the two groups. So first of all, looking at upward social mobility, so this is where children are in a higher social class than their fathers were, then the odds ratios are greater than one for both the 1958 and the 1970 cohort. And not only that, but they're actually equal in magnitude. So the effects are exactly the same in these two different cohorts uh, with different patterns of social mobility and different patterns of breastfeeding. And then looking at downward social mobility, again, the breastfed babies, the odds ratio is, is less than one. They're less likely to be downwardly socially mobile. And again, the magnitude of the effect is the same across the two cohorts. And not only that, but if you compare the upward and the downward rates, they're equal and opposite in magnitude as well. So again, all consistent uh, with this causal interpretation. Now these odds ratios are actually quite difficult for people to uh, interpret and to tell, well, you know, so quite how big are these differences that we're observing. So what we can do is, is convert them to probabilities instead, which I think people more have a sort of greater feel for intuitively. And once we convert those odds ratios to probabilities, which in fact is a sort of a, a safer thing to do when you have something that is very uh, common, like the, the, the movement up and down social groups, then we find that the effects are quite small, um, but they're still there and real. So for, uh, in general, the chances of being upwardly immob socially mobile around, you know, 50%. Sort of and there's two or three percentage points difference between those who are not breastfed and those who are breastfed. Uh, for those, for downward social mobility, there's around a 25 to 30% chance of being downwardly socially mobile, and again, a sort of a one, one to three, one to two percentage points difference. So these differences are very small, but that's what you'd expect when you think about it. We're looking at just one influence on adult outcomes, starting 30 years before the, the measurement of, of people's social destinations. There's so many other things going on in people's lives. It's, it's, it's a miracle in a way that one never finds an, an effect uh, in studies like this because so many other influences are affecting children's lives uh, and affecting their social destinations into adulthood. But here we find these small, but nevertheless, very consistent findings of, of a couple of percentage points difference uh, in outcomes for children. So do I think best is breast, best? Well, I do think that the evidence uh, points to the fact that children who are breastfed are actually socially mobile. I do, don't think they necessarily get a springboard right up the social hierarchy if they're breastfed, but they have, it has a small influence. Um, and it also, and this is something that hasn't been shown in most studies, most people look at the beneficial effects of breastfeeding and don't necessarily look at the, uh, the other way around. We've also shown that they're less likely to be uh, chucked on the, on the doll um, if they're breastfed as well. So um, I'd just like to, to stop there and uh, take any questions if anyone would like to. And just again... Thank you very much, Amanda. So I hope it's up to you now. At the top there. Um, one variable that comes to mind is that um, absent fathers may impel upon a mother who, for instance, wants to work and to make her child go up really mobile to abandon the child's breastfeeding but to enhance its ability to go to private school um, to go to university, etc. Um, and, and you didn't say much about absent fathers. For instance, I wasn't able to breastfeed, 
but I was able to keep acting as a barrister and send my son to private school and give him things and, and to university college that he couldn't otherwise have got. And you haven't mentioned adopted children either. Um, absent fathers was one of the things we looked at when we were matching the children together, so that was included in the matching process. Um, I, you know, I absolutely agree with you. This was what I was trying to sort of suggest, but there's so many other influences on, on children's lives that this is just a small part of, of, of the, the total puzzle. Um, from a population point of view, even very small differences like this can be important. At the individual level, far less important, I think. Um, so um, I think that mothers who, who can't or don't want to breastfeed shouldn't you know, sort of feel bad about it. They should be reassured that these differences are very small and there's plenty of other things influencing their children's lives. Okay, this one, this one first, and then... <clears throat> Thanks very much for your lecture. Um, trying to match these patients is extremely difficult. And the thing that springs to my mind is the concept, as nebulous as it might sound, is ambition. Because parents' ambitions for their children vary. And the um, rate of breastfeeding, which is a challenging undertaking, varies amongst social class with patients uh, sorry, parents' um, ambition and determination. How can you try to match parents' um, uh, strength of will, if you like, to go through the hardships and imbue their children with ambition? Because it's very hard to see whether or not ambition may have more of an impact than breastfeeding. Breastfeeding is simply a result of higher ambition rather than a marker of causality, like you say. Um, well, first of all, I'd sort of try, actually quite like to dispel the idea that mothers of different sort of groups have different aspirations for their children. Again, using data from these cohorts, we find that uh, mothers from all different backgrounds have equally high aspirations and ambitions for their children. What they lack is the expectations that these aspirations can be achieved, and, and that tends to be the difference between the two groups. So I wouldn't say that it's only um, sort of affluent and, and sort of middle-class parents that have got the ambitions for their children, nor that, that it's a particularly uh, a hardship to breastfeed. Yes, there are difficulties in breastfeeding when you want to go out to work, and colleagues of, of mine at the University of Essex who have carried out research in this area have shown that uh, if companies can be persuaded to have... Uh, baby-friendly policies in the workplace, not only does it keep children being breastfed for longer, but actually productivity goes up as well. And so there's benefits all round if we can persuade industry to support mothers to breastfeed and not put all the onus on the mothers. And the next question is that one there. Uh, th thanks very much for your talk. Uh, uh, I have a slightly more technical question. Uh, it's just about how you converted odds into probabilities. Between, between those two slides, did you just assume that they were the? There's a the standard. Set? There's a standard formula for converting odds to, into, to into probabilities. probabilities. Okay, that's what you. Sorry. And my second, I just had a quick follow-up, which was: Are you going to look at a changing effect of, of of social mobility between the two cohorts on breastfeeding? So that perhaps the effect of social mobility on breastfeeding might be different between 1958 and 1970. Well, we didn't find there were any differences in the social mobility for the two cohorts. That was precisely the point, if I understood you correctly. Um, we are looking now at other outcomes which might uh, be of interest to, to the more sceptical members of the audience. We're also looking at the sort of biological outcomes for children who are best fed. Um, and again, we find these small differences in biological markers which can't be socially uh, determined. Um, so. And the next question is this one up here, with the glasses. Thanks very much for your lecture and I uh, commend you in the way you've done your research but also handling such an emotive and difficult topic very sensitively. Um, so my question is about nutrition mm -hmm. and I wonder, 
given given the kind of hypothesis that you had at the beginning that there are some mechanisms why we may understand this effect, given that the delay between uh, sorry the time that these sorts of cohort studies were going on so 50, 60, 70 years ago, is there any kind of nutritional differences between infant formula now and infant formula then to suggest that a, such a small difference may have been mitigated by the fact that formula is getting better, if it is better? Um, yes, formula is getting better, and those uh, essential fatty acids that I mentioned in the talk have been added to formula milk now. Um, but the trials that have been done on it, which aren't recent trials, but the trials that have been done on the sort of supplemented formula milk compared with the old formula uh, haven't shown differences for children. So I'm not sure that that is the mechanism or not, or whether there's something about sort of adding uh, fatty acids to formula milk that sort of is not the same as the fatty acids naturally produced uh, in mother's milk. It may be that there's some slight difference there. I don't know. Um, but the evidence hasn't supported the idea that we can just add something to formula milk. When I've t spoken to um, pediatricians and so on, they, they stress that we really don't know about all the con components of breast milk. We don't know enough about what's in breast milk. And there could easily be something that we haven't identified yet that is accounting for this difference. But it's not my particular area of expertise. And then the next question is down here. Yeah, I just wanted to okay. um, follow up on the question over there. As, as I understood it, the gentleman wasn't suggesting that um, higher social status were going to have more ambition for their children. I think it was more that there, that there might be personality differences that vary systematically between women who persist with breastfeeding and women who don't, and that they might be acting as a kind of unknown confounder. And I, I wonder how much thinking you've done about sort of potential un unknown confounders that you're not able to account for with the matching? Um, Did most people grasp that question? <laughs> I, I'm, I can honestly Sorry. say that one, in observational studies like this, there's always the potential for unmeasured confounding. Um, I mean, I would be silly to say there, there isn't. But I do think the fact that we found exactly the same findings in the two cohorts and the fact that the findings were equal and opposite for both upward and downward social mobility sort of mitigate against that idea of unmeasured confounding with the sort of things like personality differences that you're mentioning because the breastfeeding rates were so different in the two cohorts. And that, you know, sort of the, the, the sort of patterning of, of temperament and other things in parents is not going to be that different between the two cohorts. But if the breastfeeding rates were different and we're still finding the same findings, I think that it, it does sort of indicate that we're unlikely to have unmeasured confounding are still there. But there's always the possibility. I would be a fool to deny it, you know. So. And the next question's up there. Do please wait for the microphone. <laughs> Hello, thank you for your talk. Um, I wanted to ask about the duration of breastfeeding. Mm -hmm. I'm seeing you didn't mention that at all and whether that has an effect on social mobility as well. Yes, it did. Um, I haven't shown it here, but we, we carried out the analysis three different ways in the end. Once comparing the non-breastfed children with children who had been exposed to any breastfeeding at all. Another one comparing non-breastfed children with children that had been breastfed for four weeks or more. And then another one comparing the children that had been breastfed for less than four weeks, including the non-breastfed children, and those fed four weeks or more. And the results were consistent with what you might expect for what's called dose-response relationship, in that the biggest effects were found for comparing the non-breastfed children with the children fed for four weeks or more. So where they were clearly separate in terms of the duration, we showed a different, bigger effect between those two groups. And the others showed intermediary effects consistent with how you'd expect things to that come out. That then is all we have time for. So it just remains me to thank uh, Amanda very much indeed for a very well-presented set of, of data on the subject. Thank you very much. <laughs>